Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. It's great to have uh, Benjamin Saunders with us uh, today. He's come all the way from Bradford-upon-Avon uh, to uh, help us out and certainly helping me out by uh, taking the service today. And uh, we're grateful too for your, for your family for releasing you for this too. And uh, today, uh, we, after the service, there's be plenty of time for us to, to spend some time together. It's a, it's a bring your own lunch followed by a Bible study at around one o'clock. Um, we've, uh, we've had a bit of a break from this, but we're going back to the uh, studies in the book of Hosea. And you might think, why study this Old Testament prophet? What's it got to do with us? Well, my answer for, the, for that for you today is, well, Jesus did. Um, we're actually going to see a passage that Jesus quotes uh, more than once uh, in his ministry. So if Jesus read this and thought that this was important, then I suggest that it must be for us too. So that's what we're going to be looking at uh, later on, uh, well, I guess, early afternoon. And then for this week, we have uh, the Puzzle Club on Monday at 10. We have a prayer meeting at 7.30 on Wednesday here in the chapel. And in two weeks' time, we have our church lunch together. So there is a sign-up sheet for that on the board at the back. For us to have a lunch, we need food, and uh, the more people are able to help with contributing to that, the better. So there's, you can serve in that way um, using that sheet on the board at the back. And with that, I'll hand over to Benjamin. Thank you. Well, thank you for your warm welcome, and it's nice to see and meet new brothers and sisters. We've gathered this morning to worship God. And we need his help to do so. So, as we come to worship, let's spend a moment to make ourselves ready and to pray to our Father. Father in heaven, we've come this morning to worship you because you are worthy to be worshipped, because you are the true and living God, because you are the creator and sustainer of all things. We come to you as those that you have made and those who are made to serve you. And so we pray that as we come this morning, you would help us by sending your Holy Spirit to help us to focus on the worship, to help us to be changed, and to make us ready for all the trials and the challenges that face us in the week ahead. Bless us, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our first hymn this morning. Our first hymn, Glory Be to God the Father, Glory Be to God the Son. Dominion thus 
us its praise creation brings. Glory, 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 glory to the King of Kings. Our first reading this morning is in the book of Zephaniah. The book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, page 667, if you're using one of the church Bibles. We'll read from verse 9 of Zephaniah, chapter 3. Then will I purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. On that day you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from this city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. But I will leave within you the meek and humble who trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will speak no lies, nor will deceit be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The sorrows for the appointed feasts I will remove from you. They are a burden and a reproach to you. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame and gather those who have been scattered. I will give them praise and honour in every land where they were put to shame. At that time I will gather you. At that time I will bring you home. I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Now let's stand again and sing. We'll sing, come, let us... No, we won't. We'll have the children's talk. Maybe. <laughs> I have written it down. I knew I would forget still. <laughs> and so, children, I want to speak to you this morning about coverings and how we cover things and why we cover things. If you hear a really horrible, high-pitched screech of a noise, or you see something that's really horrible, or you smell something that's really horrible, what do we do? We tend to cover, don't we? We cover our ears so we don't hear the horrible noise. We cover our eyes even if we see something very scary. And if there's something that smells horrible, we'll, we'll cover our nose. We have a desire to get away from whatever it is that's horrible, don't we? We don't want to be exposed to something which is horrible for us, which we'd say, uh, we say offends the senses. It offends your hearing. It's painful to your hearing, and you want to cover it over. And we do that, and we've done that for a long time. People always have seen something horrible, they want to change it. They see something that's ugly, and they want to cover it over. But that is just a way of our expressing what we really want to do which is to make things right, to make things good. And we see that more, and it's more important than when, than when we hear horrible noises. The things that we want to cover the most are not things that are coming in from the outside. It's things that are coming out of us from the inside. We, we lie, don't we? And why do we lie? We never lie for fun. We lie because we've done something and then we know it's wrong. And what do we do? We want to cover it over, act as though it hasn't happened. 
if may, lots of you look to be past the age where you would draw on a wall, but if you've drawn on a wall, what do you do? You know, your pillow goes there or something to cover it over. Why? To cover over the wrong that you've done, partly to avoid punishment, but partly because we feel shame, don't we? We might not be punished, but we still want to cover over the wrong that we've done. Why do we want to do that? Well, we want to do that because we're made in the image of God, and there's something, even if we fight against it, something that's common to all humans, that we do love at least a little bit what's beautiful. And what we know more than what we love is we recognize good and evil. And God recognizes good and evil. And we, like him, want to cover over those things that are evil. Now, it happens for us that they come from inside, but they don't come from inside of God. But God hates those evil things more than we hate those evil things. We will cover over for ourselves. Maybe we'll cover over for a friend because we're selfish. And even that itself needs to be covered over. But we look at God, and God sees sin. It says in the scripture that God's eyes are too pure even to look on evil, so he's going to do something about it. He's going to cover it over. Now for us, when we cover something over, it's still there, isn't it? I cover over my evil with a lie, but that evil is still there. I'm just preventing anyone from seeing it. But God isn't like that. God has prepared for us a covering, something that covers over the sin so he can't look at it, he doesn't see it, but something also that deals with it something that not only covers it, but wipes it away. How's he going to do that? Is it just that God is saying, I'm not going to look at it, I'm not going to deal with it, and he pretend that it will never happen? Uh, never happened. Well, he doesn't do that. He can't do that. It wouldn't be right if he knows there's sin to leave that sin. And so he prepared for us a covering, and that covering specifically was in and done through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll look at something that the Lord Jesus Christ said later this morning. The Lord Jesus Christ lived a life that didn't need any covering. He didn't ever lie. He didn't ever cheat. He never stole anything. He was never rude to his parents. He never disobeyed his parents. He always did everything in a perfect way. And so he has a life that God would be happy with. And God can look at Christ and he'd be completely pleased because there's no sin, nothing that needs to be covered the Lord Jesus Christ then, as he became a fully grown man, died on the cross, which I'm sure you know, but what you might not know is what happened on the cross, and it's on the cross that the Lord Jesus Christ is not treated by the Father as though he had lived that perfect life that didn't need any covering. It was on the cross, the Father treated the Christ as though he lived the worst life there ever was. It says in Scripture that he became sin on the cross. The father then looks at the son. He's displeased because of the sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ dies on the cross. And as he dies, he bleeds because he had nails hammered into his wrists and through his ankles. And it's that blood that is the covering that we need. We all do wrong things. The payment for those wrong things is our blood, our life blood, our lives. And on the cross, you have a man dying, payment of his blood for sin. Sin he didn't commit, though, because he committed no sin. It's in him that we have a covering. When we go into the presence of God, when I go, we prayed a moment ago, when I go into the presence of God, God doesn't look at me and see all my sin, because he can't. Because of what the Lord Jesus Christ does, and when you believe in him, you have a covering. And so when I go into the presence of God to pray, he doesn't see me anymore. He sees me with the life of Christ, all the good things that Christ did, all covered over. And he's pleased with me. So when I go, and you're the people that you know who are Christians, and they go into the presence of God, God doesn't have to cover his eyes, if you like, or cover his ears to, not to hear the horrible things you said, because he looks and he sees the covering the righteousness, the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, whatever you've done, and I don't know you, I don't know what you've done, whatever you've done, however bad you think it is, it doesn't matter. 
because the covering is enough for you as well. All you need to do is to realize you need to be covered and to go and to ask, believing that God will cover you, believing that Christ has died to save you, and he will, and you'll be covered, and you can go into the presence of God. Well, now we'll stand and sing. Come, let us join our cheerful songs. And with this wonderful covering, we ought to be cheerful, shouldn't we? Come, let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne. Ten thousand thousand are their tongues. That means their voices. But all their joys are one. God in heaven, we come and approach you now by the blood of the eternal covenant, the covenant which you have made with your Son, the seed, the promised seed, to whom the promise referred. We come now in Christ and we worship and praise you to know that if we come in faith and trust in him, that all our sins are forgiven, covered with this wonderful covering the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that as we come into your presence, as your servants, we also come as your children, those who have been adopted with all the rights of the firstborn son, with the wonderful inheritance, with all the position and honour of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you that we are co-heirs with Christ and that he is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. We worship you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, for all that you are in your, as you sit in your majesty and your power and your wisdom. We recognise that all you do is good, that every desire that you have uh, are not like our desires that are subject to change, but that your will is always good and perfect, that you act on your good and perfect will, always doing good, always increasing the good, but remaining just, a perfect judge of all the earth. We worship you and praise you for your wonderful plan that has brought us here this morning to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognise, so many of us, that we lived lives of sin, not knowing you, not being known by you in that special way. We praise you for your Holy Spirit, who came and breathed into us that new life, who gave us a new heart, 
so that we would turn from our sins and believe in you. We praise you for the wonderful work of salvation and we acknowledge that it is your work, that we haven't contributed anything to it and we can't and we never will, but that all the honour and the praise belongs to you and that all the work that needed to be done was done by you and the acceptance of the gift even was a gift given by you. We praise you for those who are faithful here this morning, for the life you've given them, for the faith you've given them, and for the Son which you gave up for our sakes. We ask, therefore, that our sins would be forgiven because of your Son and all the work that he did here in his earthly life and on the cross, We pray that our sins would be forgiven because we trust that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us now then, Father, to open our hearts to you and not to hold anything back in our minds and not to cover over any of our sins, but to uncover them, to confess them to you so that you will wipe them clean and that you will see us as those who never committed any sin rather than those who are living in disobedience to you. Thank you for the blessings which you have poured out on us in such great abundance, in such amazing amounts. We praise you and thank you for the peace that we enjoy in this country, that we can come and worship you without fear, that we are not persecuted by the government. Uh, And we know that being a Christian has struggles and difficulties in families, and in marriages. But we, we know, Lord, there are our brothers and sisters having much harder time, much more difficult time across the world who are attacked or arrested and imprisoned for their faith, even killed for their faith. And so we thank you for the peace that we have here. And we thank you, Lord, for your faithful witness here, that you have worked here, and for all the wonderful things you have done to bring this church to be and to keep it and sustain it. We praise you and thank you for your faithfulness to your people and that you have been with us through everything and you will continue to be with us and even until you return and are with us fully. Be with us as we continue to worship. We pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to come and to help us to open our minds and hearts to receive the good news that we will be open to be changed We pray, Lord, that you would make this meeting one of great blessing, not for our sakes, but for your glory and praise, that we would go out into the world made more like Christ, that we would be a better witness in our families, with our friends, and at our place of work, that we would be courageous and strong like Christ was strong, so that people see the truth of the good news even in us, and that they would be excited and interested to learn what makes us different and that they will be led to the Lord Jesus Christ who makes us different. We pray for those in authority over us, be with our King and Prime Minister and all those that serve under them. We pray, Lord, that you would save our King and save our Prime Minister, that they would bow their knee to you, the true and living God, and that they would discharge their duties in righteousness and wisdom because of all that you have done in their lives. We pray for our nation that you would be gracious and kind to it, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in great blessing on the churches, not only here, but all over the UK, that we would hear of wonderful things happening in other churches, other uh, churches growing and seeing people saved and having baptisms. We look to you to do the work, Lord, that you have promised to do. Be with those that can't be with us this morning because of ill health, and particularly those who have serious health problems and are in hospital. We pray, Lord, that you would keep them and sustain them through those difficult trials, and that those who don't believe would be brought to faith, even in their their struggles. Continue to be with us and protect us, Lord. Place your hand on us, protect us from all the tricks, all the traps, of the evil one, we pray. 
may we all gather to worship without any distractions. Come and bless us, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have our second reading, which is in the Good News According to Mark, chapter 1, page 706, if you're using the Church Bible. We'll read from verse 1 to verse 15. The Good News According to Mark, chapter 1, from verse 1. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside And all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt round his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased." At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Let's stand again and sing. We'll sing, to God be the glory, great things he has done. Jesus. 
We're going to uh, consider verse 15 of Mark 1 this morning, which we've just read. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now we think, as we come to any scripture, it's easy for us to think, why are we going to bother? Why are we going to think about this particular verse? At this time, we're going to think about this verse this morning because of its significance, its significance for us and the significance for the people at the time. We're going to think about a new age. We've all had new ages in our lives. We've we had the age of COVID and the age of post-COVID. Maybe your parents and the birth of your first child, you got married had a promotion at work, go to a new school, move house. All of these things are all very significant, aren't they? They're major points in our lives. We go from primary school to secondary school, and when we go to university, when we get married, we get the promotion that we really wanted. All of those things, they change us, don't they? They change us for the rest of our lives, some of those things. We come this morning to a similar thing, a new age, a new age of the gospel, which we read in verse 1 of Mark 1, the beginning of the gospel. What does that mean? It's not a word we use anymore, really. It means good news. It's the age of the good news, the good news of God. Now, as important as it is when we get that new job, and we have our first child, all those significant things that happen to us in our lives, all of those, they're important, but they're all nothing at all compared to this new age. And the change that this makes to us is more significant than all of those things together, and you couldn't add new ages enough to get uh, anywhere near the significance of this new age. It's the beginning of a new age, Mark 1, verse 1. But we see that there's more of this new age coming. Mark wants us to know something new is coming. Verse 4, John came, baptizing in the desert and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, what's going on there? He's making way, which is why Mark quotes Isaiah. I will send my messenger ahead of you. Someone who's going to prepare for what's to come. This new thing that's going to come. Verse 7, John says, after me will come. So there's something new that's going to come after John. And we see this new age uh, made very, very clear for us in verses 14 and 15. Verse 14, John is in prison. And that's the end of the old age. The Old Testament, when John is put in prison, the Old Testament is done. The way of Israel and the temple worship, that's all come to an end with the end of the last prophet, the end of the Old Testament. And what happens immediately after the end of the Old Testament? Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. And we have then the beginning, this new age. Now, whenever we have a big change in our lives, we need to change, don't we, to deal with that. If you're promoted at work, you can't take all the extra money from your promotion, but continue to do the job you used to do. You have new responsibilities, don't you? And you need to act in line with the job that you now have. When you become a parent, you can't act like a single man anymore. You act like a father now. 
to recognise the change, this new age. You go to a new school when you go to secondary school. You don't act like you did in primary school, do you? You act in a manner that is fit and right for the situation you're in. And so, we see in verse 15, not only the coming of this new age, but what we need to do in response to the coming of that new age. And so, this morning we're going to go through verse 15 and look at what's changed and how we need to change. And so the first thing that we're going to consider is the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. The time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Christ says here, what he's saying is, the moment that you've all been waiting for has arrived. Now that makes sense for the people that he was speaking to. Maybe we don't have the, uh, the background and know the Old Testament like Christ and those around him would have known the Old Testament. What's he talking about? What moment? What time? What time has come? Well, Mark has already told us some of it in Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5, a voice cries in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. So it's all going to be flat. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places are plain. And this is the important bit. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. It's a revelation of the glory of God. Micah 5, verses 3 to 5. He shall stand and, flock, uh, and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. And this is time of peace with the shepherd that's coming. Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of, their chil of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. What Christ is saying when he says the time is come is that the time of the Saviour is here. Those three Old Testament scriptures I read, they're all a promise of the Saviour, someone who's going to come and save Israel, someone who's going to come and bring peace, someone who's going to come and bring safety, and someone who's going to come and bring good. And so when Christ says the time has come, it's only a few, only a few words, but all of that promise of God is all wrapped up in these few words, and so he's telling the people that something very significant is now happening. He says the kingdom of God is near. Uh, some translations, depending on your translation, it might say at hand. It's close. He's saying that God is now fulfilling his ancient purposes. God always had a plan. That's what Christ is saying. And, and God makes it clear in the Old Testament that he has a plan. There's something he's going to do. And now, that kingdom, that special purpose, God is really doing it properly and fully now. The ideal reign, not as in weather, the reign of a king, is coming. You have Christ Jesus as the king of God's special people. And so when he says the kingdom uh, is near, he means that the king is near. You can reach out and take the king, and, but the people are near. You can reach out and you can take the people, you can see them and you can speak to them. And the kingdom, you can't have a, king, a kingdom that doesn't have a place, but the place is near. It's the whole world. Anything the king stands on is his own. And so he stood there on the world. And so God is fulfilling his ancient purposes. All of these things are now near. Before this, the people were near, or the place was near. But the king wasn't near. But now they're all here together. The kingdom is here. And the first thing that we think then is, but the kingdom, it's obvious the kingdom isn't here. 
because there are more people in this area than are in this building. So where's the kingdom? If Christ has said, and there were fewer Christians here when Christ said this than there are now. So where's the kingdom? We don't have to worry about that at all. It's not difficult for us to to sort this problem out. We think about our own king. He became king on the 8th of September 2022. He was publicly proclaimed king by the special council that does that two days later on the 10th of September. His coronation when he was crowned king was the 6th of May 2023. Now there's a big shit, it's a big time in between those things. When did he become king? It wasn't at his coronation, it's when he became king on the 8th of September. All that we were waiting for was for the public declaration, the public statement that he is the king, and then the public ceremony to show that he's the king. And that's what we have with the Christ. The Christ has always been king. God has always been king. Here, though, Mark is writing the public declaration that he is the king. So why don't we see the kingdom now? Because we're waiting for that coronation, the public recognition in front of everyone that Christ is the king. God has come in this passage in a new way. Never come like this before. He's come in the special promised way, which is that he would come in person, himself. He would be there, which is what we call the incarnation. God the Son come. If you read the first chapter of John, he makes it clear. The Word, the Son of God, became flesh, came and lived among us. He's come in this special way. And so, as he comes to us, and he says that the kingdom is near, we say, well, how do we get there? What people would commonly say is, how do we get to heaven? The hope of the Christian is not that we're going to go up and get to heaven. It's that God is going to come, return, and that we will be with him here on the new earth, the remade earth, perfect earth. How do we get into that kingdom? When God comes and the coronation, how do we come into the kingdom? Well, Christ tells us. And so our first thing we've considered, the kingdom of God is near. The second thing we're going to think about is what changes we need to make. Repent. Christ says, repent. The kingdom of God is near. Repent. Repent, is, it's a command. He's telling us to do something. And if, if I speak to someone in, in English, I can tell someone to do something, and I can tell lots of people to do something, and there's no way of knowing which one I'm doing. Am I telling just you on your own to do something, or am I telling everyone? In Greek, you can make it obvious whether you're telling one person or lots of people. Christ is telling lots of people. He's telling a crowd Lots of people, all of them, to repent. And it's a proper command. It's not suggestion. It's an instruction from the king. And almost more importantly than that is it's what we call a present command. Now, I can tell my children to do something once, sit down. But when I tell them, to tidy their room, it doesn't have that just one-time event. The expectation is their room will be continually tidy. And this is what Christ is doing here. He's saying, repent, and not just once. You think, okay, I've repented, that's fine. This is a present command, so we go on living all the time, repenting. What does it mean, though? Does it make sense? There's no help to us if we don't know what repent means. It means to change. He's saying change. Change in what way? Particularly, the word repent has an idea of turning away from something. So, if I used to, you know, maybe I used to go to concerts a lot, I turn away from that and don't go to concerts anymore. If I used to drink a lot, I turn away and I don't drink as much as I did. Maybe I don't drink at all. There's some sort of change 
In terms of Christian teaching, and when Christ talks about repenting, he means repent in just in one sense, and that means to turn away from sin, to turn away from failing God, turn away from doing things which God has commanded us not to do, to turn away from serving ourselves to serve God. Now, Christ commands everyone here, the crowd, but he also commands us because he speaks through his own words. And so now as he as, as it's read out, and he speaks to you, and he tells you to repent as well. Why does he tell everyone? He doesn't give any distinction. Why does he tell everyone to repent? Because he knows that everybody needs to repent. There's no one in this room that doesn't need to repent. There's no one that's ever lived except Christ that didn't need to repent. And it's important to note that as he tells us that the kingdom of God is near and we can just reach out and grab it or step into it, this is the only way. There's no other way to take hold of the kingdom of God. He tells us here the changes that are required for us to enter the kingdom of God. We think about uh, getting married... To, to understand repentance. When someone gets married, it's the beginning of the new age, isn't it? And they change to suit their new circumstances and the man turns away from everybody else. He's married his wife. His wife is his wife. And all other women now become not the wife. And he, and he treats them accordingly as a not wife. He's turned only... Uh, he's turned away from every other woman, only to his wife. Now, this is good news. This is, what, this is what Christ says. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Well, repenting is part of it. It's tied up in the good news. But it's not going to seem such good news if you don't think you need to repent. If you don't think you need to repent then all that's going on is you've come and listened to a man telling you that you're worse than you know that you are. But I want you to think of one time in your life, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this applies to everyone, one time in your life where you've done something that you know you shouldn't have done. You just have to think of one. Just one. Then you need to repent. Repent. If you have done something you know to be wrong, you're condemned in your own heart. Even by our own standards, we need to repent. And our standard is very, very bad. I am far more likely to give myself an easy ride to make a way out for myself than for anybody else. And I've still done things that I know are wrong and that I shouldn't have done. How much more with God then? How much more with God? This is what Christ has to say about God's standard. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable uh, to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if we've ever got angry without reason and called someone uh, a, a fool is not an insult now like it was then. But it's said to be degrading. You said anything that's in, intended to be degrading? I have. Liable to the hell of fire. Christ continues, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. How many of us have loved our neighbors? How many of us have loved our families and friends as we should? How much less our enemies? So we need to repent. Christ summarizes God's expectation of us 
in Matthew 7, and Matthew 5 rather, he says, you therefore must be perfect, complete, whole, as your heavenly Father is perfect, like God is perfect. That's the standard. And now repentance is not being perfect. God is, Christ is not saying be perfect. Repentance is acknowledging that I'm not. And then continually turning away from all of those things. And so being a Christian, part of it is acknowledging that I'm not perfect and always turning away from those things which I know are not right and not good. It's a, all the time turning away from sin. So the first thing we thought about the kingdom of God is near. The second thing, repent. The third thing, final thing, believe in the good news. Believe. That's a command as well. It's the same structure as the command before it. So it's to everyone who ever hears it. And it is present all the time. It's general. Again, there are no qualifications believe if you're whatever there's no there's no special way a uh, special person that needs to believe he commands everyone what does he mean when we say when we hear believe we tend to think about something going on in the mind what we call going up assent, assenting to uh, to the facts but that isn't what Christ means. The word that we have translated here as believe means trust. Trust in the good news. It's not something that happens in the mind so much as it happens in the heart. And there is a really big difference. I believe, I believe that New South Wales exists as a place. I've read about it. I can see it if I look on a map. I can see it there. And that makes no difference to my life at all. No, if, if it turned out it was wrong... Okay, and I would just live my life and make some difference. And that's very different with a parent and a child. And when the child is scared and the father or the mother says, don't worry, you don't have to be scared. Take my hand and we can go past the dog. You'll be fine. I'll keep you safe. That makes a big difference. If the child trusts the parent... The child takes the parent's hands and they go through and they, they go past the dog. It's that kind of trust that Christ is talking about. When he says trust, he means uh, this full giving even of the heart in belief. Now repent and believe are linked. You can't believe in this way, trusting God's and trusting God's promises, if you haven't already repented. And it's, in, it's interesting to note that Christ in Mark, I think, never says those two things together again. He only says, repent, because they're just one thing. And so he's described what, what the entrance is, if you like, repent and believe, and now they're just one thing, and you're to see them as one thing. And so he doesn't make a point of telling people to repent and believe. He just tells them to repent. If we think repentance is turning away, that's what it said, to turn away. Belief is the same thing, but in an opposite angle. Belief is turning to. So in repentance, I'm turning away. In trust, in this belief, I'm turning to. Towards something else. What am I turning to? The good news. Now, it's important to note, here we have in the NIV, believe the good news. And your whatever translations you might have, might have believe the good news. It should be believe in the good news. The word in is there. Now, I'm not sure why it's not there in the NIV, why they decided not to put it in. Uh, well, I understand in a manner, but that in is really important. We're not told to believe the good news. That's the New South Wales thing. I believe that exists. But we're told to believe in the good news. They're really different. If I say to you, I believe the UK government, it's really different to I believe in the UK government. 
One, again, is just going up to the facts in my mind. But the other one is a heart movement towards something. Because if I believe in the UK government, what does that mean? It means I support the UK government. I exert, exert effort to support the UK government. I'm keen that other people support the UK government. I have... Uh, the UK government is part of who and what I am. That's what Christ tells us. To believe, to trust in the good news. It's about the acceptance of the good news into the whole of your life. Not just Sunday morning. Not just at a Bible study or a prayer meeting. The good news I support. I support the good news. I care about the good news. I want other people to care about the good news. My whole life is based around this good news. I exert effort to tell people the good news. I want them to know the good news. I want to see the good news prosper and expand. So first, we know that the kingdom of God is near. It's here. Then we're told that we need to turn from our sins and trust in the good news. And so the time has come. The promised saviour has arrived. And it's up to you now. It's up to you to trust God and to respond. It's up to you to turn away from your sins. I can't turn away for you. And it's up to you to turn to God. It's up to you to believe the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ. The good news about Jesus Christ we read in verse 1. Verse 14, it's the good news of God. In verse 15, it's just the good news. How do we understand good news? If I need to believe in this good news, how should I understand it? It's the good news of the Saviour, the good news of the Messiah. I, same with all mankind, I want to be with God ultimately. That's why I cover. I want things to be perfect. I want things to be right. So, I want to be with God. But I can't be with God because of my sin. And because God won't accept me because of my sin. There's a big problem. I can't get what I want and what I need, actually, because I'm made to be with God. Same for everyone. The good news is that God has promised a saviour to deal with that second thing, that I can't be with God because of my sin. And that Christ Jesus is that saviour. It's the good news about Christ Jesus, the saviour. The good news is that if I trust in God... That if I believe in Christ Jesus, I will be saved. I will have him as my saviour. It assumes repentance. I'm not going to trust in Christ if I think I've never sinned. And it demands change. Because the acceptance of the good news into the whole of my life. That is to say, the good news is that you don't need to get the grade that will make you acceptable to God. That grade that we read, which is in Matthew 5, you're to be perfect like God is perfect. You don't need to do that. You don't need to get there first. You don't need to be there because the Messiah got it for you. This Saviour got it for you. He's got it for you already. He got it for you on the cross. Because it's there that the life of this perfect, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, it's there that the life is offered up, given up, not just straight to God, but given up to be given out to those who would turn from their sins and believe. The man who made the mark, got the grade, is happy and willing to give it out. In order to take hold of the kingdom, you must repent and believe. And it can't be a one-off. Remember, their present commands. They need to continue until you die or the Lord returns. And it must be both. 
It must be both. You can't say, I've turned away from my sins. I'm going to live a really wonderful life. I'm going to be very good. But also, at the same time, disbelieve the promises of God. They don't make sense together. You can't do that to say that you're good, but you don't believe God, because it's wrong to disbelieve God. And you can't say that you believe in Christ Jesus to be your saviour and continue to live in sin. So I'm not, I don't need to repent because I believed in Christ and Christ will save me from everything so I can just do what I want now. Because that means you've never repented. You've never come to see that you need to turn away from anything. You must do both. We thought about some new ages, didn't we? At the beginning of, of the sermon. And I said they were all nothing compared to this. And I hope that you can see they're nothing compared to this. Getting married. And I'm married. I'm not speaking out of, <laughs> without experience. Getting married is nothing compared to entry into the kingdom of God, to be with God, to be with the Christ who died on the cross, to take me to God. It's nothing. Birth of my first child. Nothing compared to the new birth in Christ, to go and to be with him, to know that I'll be with him, and to know that one day he's going to return, and he's going to say to me, specifically to me, and to all of those who believe, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come in, come into the kingdom, and share in your master's happiness. And to know that that man who will say to me, well done, for all the good that I have done, is not the good that I've done, but the good that he had done, the good that he had done and gave up his own life as a sacrifice of atonement for me on the cross, but will reward me for it. It's all nothing compared to this new age. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, and says to you this morning. The time has come. Repent and believe the good news. Let's stand and sing our final hymn, which will be on a video, I think. <laughs> Man of Sorrows, Lamb of God.
is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun says free, all is free. Thank you for this wonderful good news. We pray for all those who are listening and will listen in the future that you would cut them to the heart, that they would see their sin, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, give them strength and life to turn away from their sin and to believe in the good news. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.